use of ganja. We have with us this morning our Minister of Justice, Senator the Honorable Mark Golding, and he will update you on the latest. Minister? Yes, we have copies which we will give to you after the Minister has completed his statement. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for uh, um, Chairman of the Proceedings. Uh, P.S. Palmer, visitors um, interested in the cannabis issue, um, several of them here. Pleasure to have you all. Um, journalists, members of the media, thank you for coming. The public will recall that in June and September 2014, Cabinet had approved the uh, issuing of drafting instructions for the amendment and enactment of new legislation to do a number of things. Um, firstly, to make possession of two ounces or less of ganja a non-arrestable, ticketable infraction that does not result in a criminal record. To permit the use of ganja for religious, medical, scientific, and therapeutic purposes. To prohibit the smoking of ganja in public places to provide for the grant of licenses to permit the development of a lawful industry for medical ganja and industrial hemp. This much anticipated legislation to make provisions treating with these legislative reforms was on January 19th this year, 2015, approved by Cabinet for tabling in the Houses of Parliament. And this is being done by means of a bill that is entitled the Dangerous Drugs Amendment Act 2015. By way of background, the system of complete legal prohibition on ganja in Jamaica has been in place since 1948. It has not worked and is no longer considered fit for purpose. The reality is that ganja remains as prevalent in Jamaica today as it ever was, and even perhaps more so. Many thousands of Jamaicans have been arrested, detained, prosecuted, and convicted for possession and smoking of ganja. It has been a source of deep distrust, bitterness, and dysfunctional relationships between many youths and the police. It has damaged many lives through criminal records, which prejudice employment prospects and travel possibilities. It has abrogated the rights of the Rastafarian community who regard the plant as a holy sacrament and who have faced nearly a century of oppression in giving expression to their religious beliefs. For decades, the reform of the law related to ganja has been the subject of several recommendations and reports by public and private sector groups, including the 1977 and the 2003 Joint Select Committees of Parliament and the 2001 report of the National Commission on Ganja. Nevertheless, despite all this, prior to 2014, nothing was done to right the wrong. The winds of change have been blowing internationally. There have been significant reforms in some European countries. In our own hemisphere, Regulated medical cannabis has been permitted in Canada and recreational liberalization, liberalization has been enacted in Uruguay. The United States has recognized the need for some flexibility in approaching this issue, given that many of their own states have introduced laws to permit medical marijuana and some states have gone further to introduce more general liberalization with Colorado and the state of Washington being the lead, uh, lead states in that regard. In Jamaica, this administration has decided to move in a measured, deliberate way towards ganja law reform. The reforms introduced by the 2015 bill will reflect some of the recommendations coming out of the 2001 reports and other consultations at the local level, and also current developments and trends in other countries. A significant reform relates to the modification of the penalties for smoking ganja and possession of ganja in small quantities. 
The harsh penalty for these offenses under the existing law was a common point of concern in all the reports, in particular the imposition of a criminal record and the adverse long-term social and economic consequences suffered by persons convicted of such offenses, predominantly young men as a result of this. The first step in our reform process was achieved by the passing of the Criminal Records Rehabilitation of Offenders Amendment Act 2014, which was brought into effect on October 12, 2014. It has removed the attachment of a criminal record for possession of small quantities or smoking ganja. Administrative arrangements have been put in place to facilitate the easy expungement of past records for those offenses. The new penalty structure being introduced by the 2015 bill and the removal of the attachment of a criminal record seek to offer the opportunity for rehabilitation while respecting the human rights of offenders. In addition, the new approach is expected to positively impact the caseload of the courts as research has shown that these minor ganja cases have significantly contributed to the case backlog which burdens our overstretched criminal justice system in particular in the resident magistrates courts across the island. Another significant reform which has also been the subject of comment and recommendation in the various reports and consultations relates to the criminalization of the use of ganja by the Rastafarian community for their religious purposes. This is viewed as an undue restriction on their freedom of religion which is guaranteed under Jamaican Constitution and in particular under the Charter of Fundamental Rights and Freedoms which was introduced by bipartisan cooperation in 2011 as the sacramental use of ganja is an integral aspect of their religious practice. The provisions of the bill permit the use of ganja by Rastafarians for religious purposes and provide also for related activities such as cultivation, possession and conveyance of ganja pursuant to such use subject to stipulated requirements. Further, with increased recognition of the medicinal advantages of ganja, advantages of ganja, not only locally but also internationally, the bill provides for a legal, regulated system of medical, scientific and therapeutic use. With the changes to the ganja laws in other territories, such as the USA, Australia, and Canada, and the revenue that has been acquired by them as a result of their reforms, there has been extensive campaigning and consultation surrounding the establishment of a medical ganja industry in Jamaica. Some Jamaican scientists are already engaged in research into medicinal uses of ganja through long-standing ad hoc arrangements. However, a viable medical ganja industry cannot be established without a robust legal framework to support it. We need to position ourselves to take advantage of the significant economic opportunities offered by this emerging industry. The current law prohibits the cultivation, production, export and import, transport, trade in, possession and use of ganja. Therefore, the reforms and objectives proposed can only be accomplished through legislative amendments, primarily to the Dangerous Drugs Act. Economic opportunities also exist in relation to the production of hemp, which is cannabis that has a very low level of the psychoactive ingredient THC, and its versatile array of industrial byproducts of a variety of kinds. And the 2015 bill will also enable a regulated industry in hemp to emerge. I move now to our international obligations. Jamaica is a small, independent country that believes in the rule of law. Given our size and limited resources, our national security and in ter territorial integrity depend on upholding the rule of law in the international sphere. And we have always respected and complied with our international obligations, just as we expect other countries to do the same in relation to us. Therefore, in considering any change to the law relating to ganja, it is critical that regard must be had to obligations under the relevant international agreements to which Jamaica is signatory. These agreements place certain limitations on the changes that can be made to our domestic law, 
without violating our international obligations. Of particular significance are the 1961 UN Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs and the 1972 Protocol amending that single convention, which lists cannabis among the, dangerous, the most dangerous substances that are particularly harmful. Unless and until the stipulated requirements in these international conventions are reviewed and adjustments made, Jamaica is obliged to ensure that the reform of our domestic legislation is within the present scheme of our international obligations. However, these international obligations permit some flexibility. They allow for the use of ganja for medical or therapeutic purposes, subject to regulation by way of a licensing regime, and also industrial hemp, i.e. cannabis with a very low level of the psychoactive ingredient THC. They also recognize the supremacy of the constitutions of member states when it comes to the particular domestic regimes to give expression to the ob obligations to control, restrict, and impose sanctions in respect of prohibited activities relating to drugs. The international conventions therefore provide flexibility treatment of the use and possession of ganja in our local context. And our approach to this reform is fully cognizant and respectful of these international conventions and Jamaica's obligations under them and seeks to operate within the treaty framework of permissible approaches. The 2015 bill that has been approved by cabinet for tabling in parliament therefore amends the law taking into account recent developments in other jurisdictions, our local culture and the need for economic advancement without violating our international obligations. Before I describe the for reform provisions in the 2015 bill, two important aspects of this new legislation need to be highlighted. Firstly, it must be emphasized that these reforms do not represent a softening of our stance on illegal drugs and related criminal activities. Jamaica remains fully committed to the fight against transnational illegal trafficking in all forms of prohibited drugs and the organized crime that it fuels an ongoing effort which is fundamental to our national security at home and our international reputation and relationships. The financial penalties related to the offenses involved in transnational drug trafficking have become outdated with the depreciation in real terms of no nominal monetary values over time. These financial penalties are therefore being significantly increased by the 2015 bill and Jamaica will continue to work cooperatively with our international partners to ensure robust law enforcement in this area. Secondly, it is fully recognized that the use of ganja in Jamaica by adolescents and other vulnerable groups is a pressing social problem. However, the current approach of outright prohibition of ganja has in no way addressed this problem. In fact, it has made it worse because many adolescents are attracted to experimenting with things that are regarded as taboo, and this has attracted many of them, no doubt, to ganja use. Whereas public education around unsafe sex and alcohol drinking practices has become quite prevalent here, the legal prohibition on ganja has meant that the very real need for public messaging to discourage abusive practices in relation to ganja has largely been ignored. This needs to change. Therefore, it is intended that a portion of the revenues from the licensing regime that is to be established under the bill will be used to support public education campaigns to discourage the use of ganja by adolescents and other children, persons with mental disorders, pregnant women and other vulnerable persons, and to mitigate adverse public health consequences associated with the use of ganja. It is also intended that our institutional arrangements for the tackling of the problems of drug abuse, and in particular, our mental health services and the National Council on Drug Abuse will be strengthened by this source of new revenues. The revenues will also be used to support the regulatory framework that is being established to govern the medical, scientific, and therapeutic ganja industry. The Minister of Finance is given specific authority under the bill to direct the allocation of these revenues for these important purposes. I will now describe in general terms the main reform measures that will be introduced by the 2015 bill. And I'll do this in 
some categories. I'll start with general amendments. The 2015 bill amends the definition of ganja to exclude hemp and defines hemp as cannabis sativa containing um, concentrations of the, um, the ingredient THC of less than 1%. The bill makes the possession of two ounces or less of ganja a ticketable infraction that is not subject to powers of arrest or detention, is dealt with outside the court system, and does not result in a criminal record. The bill removes the existing offense of smoking ganja from the Dangerous Drugs Act and makes smoking ganja in public places a ticketable infraction that is not subject to powers of arrest or detention, is dealt with outside the court system and does not result in a criminal record. The bill permits the cultivation of five or less ganja plants on any premises, which will be regarded as being for medical or therapeutic use of the leaves or for horticultural purposes, both of which are per um, permissible under the international conventions. I'll move to amendments related to religious purposes. The bill permits the possession of ganja for religious purposes as a sacrament in, adha in, adher in adherence to the Rastafarian faith. The bill also empowers the min minister responsible for justice to authorize a person, group of persons, or organization adherent to the Rastafarian faith to cultivate ganja on designated lands to be used for their religious purposes. It also authorizes the minister to declare an, an event as an exempt event where he is satisfied that it is promoted or sponsored by a person, group of persons, or organization adherent to the Rastafarian faith and is primarily for the purpose of the celebration or observance of that faith, which means that persons will not be subject to penalty for conveying to possession or smoking of ganja at those exempt events. I move to amendments related to medical and therapeutic purposes. The bill permits the use of ganja for medical or therapeutic purposes as prescribed or recommended in writing by a registered medical practitioner or by another health practitioner approved by the Minister of Health for this purpose. The bill permits persons who are suffering from cancer or other serious chronic illness to import ganja or, or products comprising ganja where their use is recommended by a registered medical practitioner in an amount not exceeding that recommended by the registered medical practitioner. And this measure recognizes an immediate need for persons with such illnesses to access cannabis strains and derivative products that have been developed overseas, pending Jamaica developing our own medicinal capacities in this area. The bill permits persons visiting Jamaica who provide satisfactory evidence that their use of ganja for medical or therapeutic purposes has been prescribed by a medical practitioner in the jurisdiction where they are ordinarily resident to purchase a permit authorizing them to purchase and possess up to two ounces of ganja while in Jamaica subject to certain conditions, including the payment of a prescribed fee. I move to amendments relating to scientific and research purposes. The bill permits the use of ganja for scientific research conducted by an accredited tertiary institution or a research institution otherwise approved for this purpose by the Scientific Research Council. It also empowers the minister responsible for science and technology by order to authorize an institution or body to cultivate and or import ganja or pl any part of the plant for scientific research. The bill, and I move to the licensing regime relating to the medical marijuana industry. The bill provides for the establishment of a new regulatory body, the Cannabis Licensing Authority, which will be responsible for establishing a lawful regulated hemp and medicinal ganja industry. The Cannabis Licensing Authority will, with the approval of the Minister responsible for justice, make regulations treating with, among other things, procedures and criteria for applying for and retention of licenses, permits, and other authorizations for cultivation, processing, distribution, sale, and other handling of ganja for, med for medical, scientific, and therapeutic purposes. The bill specifically requires that these regulations made by the Cannabis Licensing Authority with the approval of the minister must be compliant with Jamaica's international obligations. 
Jamaica recognizes that certain monitoring, reporting, and other enforcement mechanisms must be implemented to safeguard against the licensed activity being used as a pretext for illicit drug trading or cont contributing to financial financing criminal enterprises. These reforms will be supported by a regulatory framework to be developed and enacted by way of regulations under the bill. The new Cannabis Licensing Authority will take the lead in developing the details of the regulatory, regulatory framework. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I close by saying it is my intention to table this bill in the Senate this week, Friday. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. We now open the floor for questions. And remember, we're dealing with I issues relating to this legislation first, then we'll deal with matters relating to the Commission of Inquiry. Andre. Yeah. Uh, morning, Minister. Morning. Uh, I recognize that there is a cannabis licensing authority which is to come mm -hmm. on stream. But um, one thing I didn't hear you address in detail is the implications for small farmers, people who now cultivate their farms, and what this will mean for them. Thanks. It is intended that the licensing regime will be developed in a way that is inclusive and allows the participation in the industry of those who want to come on board through a, le a lawful system. So the details of those regulations should be such as will facilitate small farmers participating in the industry. Um, those who choose not to participate in a lawful regulated industry and remain outside of that system will continue to be subject to criminal prosecution for cultivating unlawfully. Um, and yeah. Why do you um, propose to wait on the mic? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, we talk about the licensing regime, but um, is there a ceiling number of persons who can be licensed over a particular period? Or a no, time? That no ceiling is anticipated in terms of the number of persons who can participate um, through getting licensed and operating in accordance with their licenses. Go on to the next question, Minister. Mm -hmm. you, you speak about the ticketable um, infraction. Mm -hmm. We know of the problems that we have had, even though currently there are there is um, attempts being made by Parliament to to amend the Road Traffic Act to deal with some of the issues that we had, the problems that we had with um, the ticketing system. But here it is, we are introducing, I suppose, a, a similar. Um, system. How I'm trying to figure out though, how how will this be policed and, and implemented? Mm -hmm. Do you have any idea? The the ticketing, the traffic ticketing system um, suffered from being a a manual system for many years, um, and handling the volume of tickets under that system became um, very difficult. And it re there was a change to an electronic based system in I think September it was 2010 um, which, whereby the ticketing details are entered into a database and the data can be managed through computers. That system is being steadily upgraded. Is, um, there is an interministerial um, group which is looking at um, enhancing that system and preparatory steps have been uh, taken um, for the ability of that system to accommodate tickets for other types of offenses such as these. It, I, I anticipate that this will become something which is a tool that may be used for other types of minor offenses as well because we need to move as many of the sort of offenses that don't really need to be handled by court out of the court system um, because of the challenges we have in managing the volume of cases in the courts. Abka Fitzhenley, Nationwide News. A question to Minister Golding. This whole ganja business, we are told global is a multi-billion dollar business. I see here where you are purporting to empower the minister, the science minister, to by order authorize an institutional body to cultivate and or import ganja or any part of the plant for scientific research. Um, mm -hmm. Why are you purporting to empower such power in one one person was there any consideration to 
not well, visiting one person. It's a power to authorize research institutions to do some cultivation for their research purposes. And because there are strains and seeds and other things that have been developed around the world that may be useful to incorporate in that research, um, along with our indigenous strains that we have in Jamaica, um, some importation um, for scientific research purposes will be permitted as well. Um, the, the, uh, the Scientific Research Council it will be the body that authorizes institutions who are um, not accredited tertiary institutions because the accreditation process is really not, um, is still, I think, under some development. Um, but the SRC will be enabled to authorize other uh, research institutions to do cultivation if they're satisfied that they have the wherewithal to do it in a way that will ensure that it's properly managed, monitored, and so on. Um, yeah. As opposed to giving the power to just the minister to authorize the import, etc., was there any consideration to perhaps vest that power to cabinet or that sort of thing? Well, the minister is answerable to cabinet um, to the extent that he's exercising powers that um, are delegated to him by legislation, though he should do so in, in the context of a policy that's been approved by cabinet. Um, but I don't think it's the norm for specific licenses uh, or permits to, um, to, that a, a minister is authorized to grant under legislation to, to all be shifted to the cabinet to handle it. Gov you know, it, it would be, I think, um, a bit cumbersome to, to do that. And this is really for research purposes, so I don't think that it's an issue that should be of concern to allow the minister to be authorizing um, research institutions to do to cultivate for their own purposes or indeed to import particular strains of, to enhance that research. Mm -hmm. um, recognize, uh, yeah. Yes. Um, good morning, Minister. Morning. Um, I, I, I note a section on page 10 from your statement. Could you please refer to page 10 of your statement, sir? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Um, the second paragraph from the top, begin with yeah. per permits for persons visiting Jamaica. Yes. So we're on the same page, Minister. We are. Yeah. Minister, um, why have you decided to allegedly discriminate against foreigners for them to pay to use ganja, which is a, a legal, it's legal for two ounces or less? and yet you're asking foreigners to pay a fee. Why are you doing that? First of all, possession is still remains a ticketable infraction. It's not an arrestable offense, but it's a ticketable infraction. In order to be able to use it so that it's not a ticketable infraction, you have to be authorized by a medical practitioner or a health practitioner. Persons visiting Jamaica, rather than forcing them to go to see a doctor to get a permit. If they already have gone through that expense in their home jurisdiction and they can satisfy the uh, um, relevant authorities here that they have that permission abroad, we'll be able to purchase a permit which will enable them to access the um, cannabis for in accordance with their own health needs while they're here. And that has an administrative cost to it and a permit fee will be charged for that. I think it's an empowering provision which should also generate substantial revenue for Jamaica. Minister, I'm not satisfied with your answer, but I, I'm sure you have a thoughtful person you will think about it further after you leave here. My final question, Minister, on this issue. Mm -hmm. I note that your document, sir, has not indicated that there is an appeal board, appeal tribunal. So the, the power, the, what is it saying, sir, that the minister has total carte blanche power, and I, I, don't, I think this is dangerous. You need an well, appeal process. The, the Cannabis Licensing Authority is the one that has the power to grant the licenses, not the minister. The minister can give specific permits for certain purposes, but for in, involvement in the industry, there will be a licensing regime which will be developed by the Cannabis Licensing Authority itself. And their decisions, if they breach the law, if they don't follow due process, if they act outside the scope of the regulations, will be subject to judicial review. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Yeah. Yeah. Do I have nothing to do? We can consider that in the regulations themselves. All right, thanks. Um, yes. Prominent Secretary Damon Phillips from CVM uh, Television. Are you able to give us some numbers? How many persons are currently before the courts for ganja possession? Uh, how many persons are incarcerated for ganja possession? Are you able to furnish the press briefing with, with those numbers? Well, the truth is that the data gathering within the court system is an area that is weak and is an area that is being focused on under the JUST program, which is a Canadian funded four year program for introducing the justice reform that has been on the card since the 2007 report. We don't have very good data. A lot of the data that we have is anecdotal. But I can assure you that if you attend the courts of this island on a regular basis, you will see that there are a, a, a number of young men on a regular basis brought before the court for possession of small quantities of smoking ganja. And I see it frequently from where I sit with expungement and so on. So I don't have a number to give you here today. It's something that we could try and get. But um, I think that it is fair to say that there have been thousands, many thousands of young people um, who have in the past been subject to arrest and detention under those laws. We, we like to use Mario Dean as a, a marker, the incident with Mario Dean. But have, they, have you been paying closer attention to these numbers, these persons uh, brought before the courts, uh, released, uh, paying attention to how the police treat them since then uh, by either mm -hmm. appointing a, a set of individuals to pay closer attention in collaboration with the Ministry of National Security? Yeah. Um, the Minister of National Security, who is responsible, one of his, his responsibilities includes lockups and, and prisons. So this is an area that falls really within his portfolio, but we do collaborate on issues relating to justice, which are of course impacted by conditions of, of detention. After the awful Mario Dean um, uh, situation, um, he had announced a policy which he had developed with the Commission of Police, whereby the police would in their discretion no longer seek to arrest and detain persons for possessions of small quantities. Be this was at a time when the cabinet had already approved this policy and what was happening was that the legislation was under development but had not yet reached where it ha ha now has. Um, and I believe if you look at the statistics, and he has actually spoken publicly to this recently, if you look at the statistics for 2014, the number, while all major crimes were sig significantly reduced over prior years, including murders, I think, which were reduced by 16%, and police fatal shootings were reduced by over 50%, which is a very impressive statistic and needs to continue. Arrests were also substantially down. Curfews were virtually eliminated, but arrests were substantially down. And he has told me that a major contributing factor to the reduction in the number of arrests was because of the policy that was implemented um, that persons who are caught with a smoking or in possession of small quantities should not be subject to arrest. They brought their, because the law that we're now talking about was not yet in effect, the approach that was recommended was to issue summonses and so on rather than detain them. And in terms of the conditions of detention in Jamaica, Cabinet appointed a subcommittee comprised of myself and, and Minister Bunting, Na Minister of National Security. And we brought in stakeholders from within the public service, the correctional facilities, the courts, the DPP's office, and so on, and also from NGOs who are interested in, in these matters, human rights are affected by detention. And we started our work in September. We established three different working groups looking at different aspects. One was looking at the rules and regulations governing detention and how you access bail. Another group was looking at the actual physical infra infrastructure of our detention facilities. A third group was looking at the rules governing 
internal, the internal rules governing the police in how they r manage correctional um, lockups and correctional facilities. The well, police don't manage correctional facilities, but lockups in particular. Um, that those three working groups have produced a set of recommendations which are going to be taken to cabinet. We have a draft cabinet submission around those recommendations. A lot of work was done um, by that, the, the working group for which I wish to publicly thank them. Um, and I hope that once we um, get this submission to cabinet and if it, once it's approved, we will be speaking more fulsomely to some of the details of what is being proposed. We're going to take two further questions on this um, issue. Mm -hmm. I, are you wearing your journalist hat this morning? No, Did sir. <laughs> no, I'm not. I just thought I, I would like to make a response to Mr. Dennis' question that he raised yes. as to why is it that we seem to be discriminating against foreigners by saying that there would be a fee for the purchase of two ounces of ganja or for medical reasons for treatment. This legislation, this argument that you have posed here is keeping in current world practices. Mm -hmm. People travel all over the world and go to specific countries for specific medical treatments. Yeah. Medical tourism is a major, also multi-million dollar industry. Our neighbors to Cuba make significant incomes from treating people in this regard. So it's not a, it's not a discriminatory practice. Mm -hmm. It is keeping in tandem with what happens universally. Mm -hmm. Secondly, and most importantly, you would have to have some record of these transactions. Mm -hmm. If not, you could be guilty of infringing mm -hmm. the situation under the process of legalization. So those things are safeguards. Yeah. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. And I just wanted to add to that. Um, it's the question of discrimination doesn't arise. It's, uh, I, I was perplexed by your, the formulation of your question. <laughs> the, it is an empowering provision because it allows a person who has already seen their doctor and received a prescription or recommendation in another jurisdiction, which would not normally be uh, usable in our jurisdiction, to purchase a permit and thereby access the rules around medical marijuana here. Um, and this, uh, this is really, they, they don't have to do that. If they come and if they want to go and see a Jamaican doctor and get a prescription and so on, or what, they're free to do so. This is not mandatory for them, but it will facilitate those persons. Um, and as they are often visiting for recreation, you know, as tourists see, and wellness tourists, um, this will make, enhance their, 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 their stay and allow them to continue their treatment while they're here. And as I said before, we anticipate that this will be um, something that many visitors will want to avail themselves of. Minister, right, Minister, do you have a timeline for the passage of this legislation? And secondly, you speak of this um, regime and uh, that the money will be used for funding the, the, the industry, for public education and so on. But I'm trying to find out um, where will these funds go? Will they go to the console, or is there a special fund set up for yeah. this? Um, first question was about the timeline. Um, as I mentioned, the bill, I h intend to table the bill, um, unless there's any <laughs> problem with the printing or anything. I intend to table the bill on Friday in the Senate. Um, we're going into the budget period, and the budget is under our new fiscal responsibility regime, we are getting to the point where we conclude our budgeting arrangements um, prior to the commencement of the coming fiscal year, whereas in the past we've had the budget being processed going on while your fiscal year has already started. So that means that a lot of things that used to be done in April and, um, and even May are being shifted to February and March. So that has to be borne in mind in, in terms of any timeline for any legislation that's being introduced to Parliament now. But Minister Paulwell um, has indicated that he intends to deal with this matter expeditiously when it reaches the House. And for it to get to the House, because it's being introduced by the Minister of Justice who sits in the Senate, it has to go through the Senate first. So it will be tabled this Friday 
and then we can debate it the following Friday. But I would want to discuss that with the leader of government business in the, Sen in the Senate first to see how he feels about the timing. But there's no intention to drag this out. Yeah. And the second question, um, yeah, the funding. And the, um, those arrangements will have to be worked out with the Minister of Finance. A separate dedicated fund is not provided for. Um, there is a, a view that having too many discrete funds scattered around the place can result in a misallocation of resources. Um, but the bill does contemplate and specifically provide for the Minister of Finance being able to direct that those revenues are allocated to specific, um, these specific important causes. So the precise mechanism by which that will be done will have to be worked out, but the principle is embodied in the legislation. Mm -hmm. nice. um, Sure. Minister, just going back to these young men that uh, would have had criminal records, how, how is the ministry moving to assist them with, with getting jobs? Is there a, a, a new focus on these individuals? Um, yes. Um, there is a team within the ministry that I have mandated to work out um, specific regulations because the, the act as amended in 2014 allows the minister to make regulations for facilitating the automatic expungement so that work is underway but even prior to that we have implemented an administrative arrangement with the police whereby if anybody applies for an extract of their criminal record whether they're seeking a visa employment or whatever that is administratively treated as an application for expungement of their, if they have a conviction for small quantities of ganja or smoking in the past. And that is then addressed and the, and it's, it, and the expungement takes place pr and their record is then, the extract is then produced without them having to go through any separate application process. So it is already being implemented um, on the ground. Were you indicating you have a question? Yes. yes. Um, just wait for mm. the microphone. Um, and this is our final uh, question on this. <laughs> uh, good morning, Minister. Morning. The issue of um, the finance ministry and the, 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 the use of the funds. Yes. What we were actually looking at, is it, Minister? The quest my question is this. Prior to license fees mm -hmm. and other fees is being collected. Um, we are thinking that the finance ministry should in fact provide funding, funding that would be recoupable down the road. But there is a timeline that would be set, say a year, that the, the funding for the regulatory regime will be put in place by the government and recollected of the fees that will be collected. And right. one could project, as I said, a timeline, maybe a year, 18 months, two years, that the government would have this dedicated fund. Otherwise, what we would be saying is that here you'll have an industry that would be delayed, it will be delayed, awaiting the collection of fees and taxes yeah. before you have a fund to do public education, which is required now public education that is yeah. yes I mean I just clearly the funds to enable this cannabis licensing authority to be established and get off the ground and do their work that has to be provided for in the normal budgeting process um, and the ministries involved will have to find those funds um, science and technology um, industry and commerce all of the, in fact there are several ministries that are involved in, uh, who are represented on the licensing authority, in addition to um, persons outside the public sector. But within the public sector, there are several ministries involved, agriculture, health, national security, and so on. And there's a provision which requires each ministry to support the, the, the efforts and needs of the licensing authority to the best they can. So the normal bud budgeting process and those provisions that I've just referred to would be what is being relied on to get the 
regulatory system up and running. The question of how the revenues are deployed is addressed in the bill in the manner I have said. Um, so there will be, um, the Minister of Finance will be empowered to um, allocate specific revenues from that source towards certain principles and certain activities. Um, public education for vulnerable groups, supporting the regulatory system, supporting mental health services, the National Council of Drug Abuse, and so on. But it's not, that w it's not a situation where we're waiting on those revenues before we can set up the system. The, sy the system will have to be set up in a normal way. Thank yeah. you, Minister. Yeah. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Golding, fulsome discussion, presentation on the amendments to the new legislation um, on the ganja. Um, and for your questions um, this morning. And, and I'm sure if, minister, if, if you yeah. have further questions, if Minister has the time, he'll take them afterwards. Before we open the floor for issues on the Commission of Inquiry, I just want to inform you that tomorrow the Cabinet will be meeting in a special meeting. We will be hearing submissions from the Ministry of Finance as we get ready for our budget presentation. And as Minister Golding had told you earlier, that we're starting the process earlier this year. And of course, after tomorrow's deliberations, we will update you in a press release. So we now open the floor for... I know, I would, uh, I, would, I would just add that, you know, those who came for the ganja discussion, yes, if, you, if you want if to, if you want to sit through this, other, you're welcome to do so, but don't feel uh, obliged. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Thanks. <laughs> Wait for the microphone, now, please. Thanks. Well, it's right behind you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. You're in a bird's eye position. <laughs> Sorry, in a vice band. Mm -hmm. uh, Minister, mm -hmm. there has been much public comment mm -hmm. about the cost of the inquiry, yeah. the Tivoli inquiry. Yes. Um, you are on record of as, as defending it to say, well, it is possibly justifiable, etc. Mm -hmm. You indicated on Nationwide Radio really recently that, well, aired on Nationwide, that's the only station I listen to mostly. Um, and that no, no promotion. That, no um, <laughs> <laughs> that, um, you may need to because widen your horizons. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, because of the credibility of their report. Because oh, of the credibility. Okay. But Minister, mm -hmm. Minister, they, um, you indicated that a million dollars or a, a million, million a billion dollars, mm -hmm. a billion dollars has been spent in terms of compensation <laughs> prior to the inquiry. Mm -hmm. um, the member of parliament, Mr. McKenzie, Mr. McKenzie said that to, to the best of his knowledge and belief, only $52 million have been, has been spent. And you indicated by response this morning on Nationwide that you there were ancillary expenses paid by other ministries. Um, other agencies. How, how do you, yeah, other agencies of the government. Yeah. How do you rationalize the difference between 52 million and a billion? Yeah. The figure, first of all, the Ministry of Labor and Social Security um, spent 90, I think it was 90 million dollars. Um, plus 10 million of administrative costs after the 2010 events towards support for the victims. That would be 100 million. We were advised in cabinet that s other funds totaling approximately a billion dollars were also provided through various state agencies towards support for those communities that had been impacted by those events. I have asked for more detail on that. When I spoke on Nationwide on Monday morning, I was recalling that information that had been provided to Cabinet. I think in September 2013, we were given that information. Um, and I recalled it, and I s mentioned it. I am seeking now from the Ministry of Finance further details to flesh out how those funds were comprised. But I believe, for example, that agencies such as the UDC, the Social Development Commission, and there may be others, were um, routes through which the funding was provided. Mm -hmm. I didn't speak this morning, so it must have been a tape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Well, I said I'm trying to um, get the information to support what I had been told, which is I was told that a, a roughly a billion dollars, separate and apart from the 100 million that Minister Kelly had spoke to in Parliament, that there were some other amounts that had been expended. Um, I was told this. I mentioned that I had been told this. Um, and I've asked for the information to support it. That's, that's mm -hmm. um, I have not yet received that information. Andre. 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 A couple of things, Minister. The opposition has called for for at the for the commission to be put on hold or for another method, a cheaper method, to be used to extract what inf whatever information the government might might need. Can you respond to that one? And can you explain the difference between I think the original budget was I think the original budget was 53 million or 50 million. Can you explain the difference between 50 million and over a quarter billion dollars? For, the, yeah. for what we know is the budget now. Yeah, there's a, I'm going to deal with the second issue first, and I'll deal with the first issue. There's been a m misunderstanding um, being, which has been propagated or banded around in the media, which I must say surprises me, um, because uh, it seems fairly clear to me. In the budget, for the current fiscal year, March 1, th sorry, April 1, 2014, through March 31, 2015. When those estimates of expenditure were tabled a year ago, roughly, there was an amount of $100 million that was provided for, which was the estimate of what costs would be incurred in this financial year on the inquiry. It was an estimate. At the time, the commissioners had not even been engaged yet. The arrangements were not yet finalized. We were, we were hoping to have started the inquiry in June of, that, of, of, of 2014, um, and the figure of 100 million was a sort of best efforts guess as to what should be provided in the fiscal accounts for supporting the inquiry. Um, when, the, in the meantime, the, the Ministry of Justice in tandem with the Ministry of Finance, proceeded to do the work necessary to nail down all the costs. As it transpired, the Commission of Inquiry didn't actually commence its hearings until December 2014. Some preparatory work was done before then by the persons who uh, were being engaged um, to get ready for the inquiry. But the hearings began, two weeks of hearings, in December, and it has anticipated that there will be another two weeks of hearings in February. As a result, in the supplemental estimates that were tabled in December, it was appreciated that the 100 million would not be spent in this fiscal year, and it was reduced to 50 million to cover those costs that would be anticipated to be spent in the fiscal year. Remember, we budget on a cash basis in Jamaica, so you're budgeting for what cash you anticipate you will need in the period governed by the budget. Um, so the 50 million was never the budget for the inquiry. The 50 million was the estimate as to what cash would be needed to meet the expenses of the inquiry that would be incurred in this fiscal year. And those are adequate for that purpose. The overall cost of the inquiry um, has been nailed down, um, and I will speak to that now. By way of background, you recall that the Commissions of Inquiry Act was amended in 2013, and it was amended in a variety of ways, but one of the things that was included in it was a requirement that the financial secretary must enter into written agreements with the persons who are providing services to a commission of inquiry, so as to know the costs that it will be incurred, at the st um, and to know that from the start, so that pr adequate budgeting can be done. If, there ti if those charges include what we call time-based fees, in other words, professionals who charge for their services by the hour, those agreements must have a cap, a ceiling, a maximum on the total number of hours and the total fees that can possibly be charged. So the agreements that have been signed with the various persons who are engaged for this inquiry, the three commissioners, the senior and junior counsel, the secretary to the commission, the senior and junior counsel to the commission, all have a cap 
in them. And it's a cap which is derived from the anticipated duration of the inquiry, which was three m months of sittings, hearings, and two months of report writing. And a cap on each day, how many hours can be billed for in a particular day when the hearings are on the way, how much can be, how, how, the maximum number of hours that can be billed in any day where it's not sitting but work is being done, how, much, how many hours can be billed for in a day where they're writing the report. And all of that was used to calculate what the cap was, applying the hourly rate that was agreed with each of them. So one arrives at a total. That is not necessarily the fees that they will charge. They may charge, end up being paid less if the, co if the Commission of Inquiry is completed in a shorter space of time than three months of hearings. And that will depend on the willingness of persons to come forward and give evidence. So, and those who come forward and give evidence have to face cross-examinations, which is part of the normal process of a judicial inquiry to arrive at the truth. So we will see the, the amount of appetite that, we ha that, that there is out there for persons to come in and give evidence. We're hoping that people who have something to say will come and say it. However, to the extent that the time taken goes beyond the cap, the fees don't increase beyond the cap. That is the purpose of the cap. The purpose of the cap is to enable certainty around the maximum that can be charged. So we have a handle on what the cost of this inquiry cannot exceed. And that is roughly $244 million for those who are directly engaged by the financial secretary to provide services for the inquiry. The police and the, and the military have separately engaged their own counsel. And they, those costs are not really part of the inquiry's costs, but ultimately will be borne by the state because of police and the military are paid for by the state. And we have a handle on those amounts as well. So that the total amount of the inquiry, when you take those other costs into account, we're anticipating will be in the region of 340 odd million dollars of which 244 million, I think, is the actual expenses of the inquiry itself, and the other portion, 90-odd, covers the costs that will be incurred by the military and the police in their representation at the inquiry. The only anticipated cost that could be, uh, um, go beyond that would be if the hearings take more than three months, we have booked the, the facility for the period of the hearings. And clearly, if we had to book it for longer, there would be some rental costs associated with that. But though that is a relatively small element in the scheme of things. I just wanted to add, and this is very important, that the hourly rates that are being charged by the persons who are providing services to this inquiry are in the same ballpark as those that were charged by the persons who provided similar services in the FinSAC inquiry, and in the man at Fels and Phillips inquiry. In fact, if you add up the hourly charge for each commissioner, the two counsel, and the secretary, uh, the persons who are engaged for the purpose of this inquiry, along with the, and you compare it with, and you add up the hourly charges for the persons who are engaged for the FinSAC inquiry, you get a total hourly cost. And the total hourly cost of those persons, in the case of the FinSAC inquiry, was 1,650 US dollars. And in the case of this inquiry, is 1,670 US dollars, $20 different per hour. It is the, the reason why this inquiry is going to cost more than the Man at Phelps and Phillips inquiry did is because the scope of this inquiry is significantly greater and the time that will be taken is likely to be longer. In the case of the Man at Phelps and Phillips inquiry, the issues that were being looked under, uh, into under the terms of reference were fairly narrow in their scope and involved a relatively small number of individuals. The Prime Minister of the day, Bruce Golding, the, the Attorney General Minister of, National, uh, Minister of Justice of the day, the Minister of National Security of the day, uh, um, the officer within the Attorney General's chambers who had provided certain legal advice to them, the person within the DPP's office that had handled the extradition request, and so on. In this case, Communities were affected. Many, many people were affected by the events of 2010. A state of emergency was declared, arising from the government's reluctance to extradite a wanted person. Nine months of delay and obfuscation. 
resulting in a state of emergency, resulting in the full law enforcement capability of the state being deployed against a community, which happens to be the constituency of the, the Prime Minister of that time. Seventy odd people were killed. It was a huge issue. A an issue of monumental historical importance and Jamaica owes it to itself and the future of our people to understand what took place and to get the truth out. I, the cost is, is there, the costs are high, yes. The, the, when you're hiring people of a certain caliber, it costs money to do so and we wanted to have persons, commissioners engaged in this instance who were above the fray, who were competent persons, at the ha of international reputation. We wanted to have a, a person, a chairman from outside of Jamaica so that the question of any political connection could be avoided. Um, we were concerned with some of what we had seen in the Manat inquiry and how that inquiry was conducted. Not everybody was happy with the manner in which it was conducted. We wanted to get persons who we felt could do so effectively and it cost some money to do that. 10, 20 years from now, when they've finished their work and the report is tendered, and whatever recommendations in it are reviewed and hopefully implemented. What it will be remembered was the events of May 2010, the truth that was ascertained from this inquiry, and the whatever steps have been taken to make sure that that is not repeated, not the cost of this inquiry. Of course. Okay. I'm, I'm, we will come yeah, back to you, Andre. Yeah. Please allow Andre. Yes. Andre. Andre. Well, he, he had had two questions, actually. I think I answered one no, of them. No, you answered. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, allow Minister right. to answer, and, and then, then we'll come back to you yeah. if you have another one. Do you remember what the second one was? <laughs> what was the second one again? Oh. Oh, for the Yes, okay. thank you. Thank okay. you for the reminder. Here. I don't know what other method they have in mind. However, we feel that a judicial inquiry is the appropriate approach. And we have strengthened the law in 2013 to make sure that what happened in the 2001 case, where certain politicians refuse to come and give any testimony. That cannot happen again, because if they do so, they, they face legal consequences. So everybody who has um, information that is relevant to the terms of reference and ascertaining the truth is obliged to come. And the powers of the inquiry has powers, um, judicial, quasi-judicial powers to monitor their proceedings, ensure fairness, transparency, and appropriate controls of the process. We feel it's important that the process take place and that it be managed through a judicial inquiry process and not some ad hoc or unknown process that may cost less perhaps or may not, but I don't know what they have in mind. But we are embarking on this. It's provided for in the law. There's a statute that was established for commissions of inquiry. We've strengthened it and we're embarking on this. We, this idea of a commission of inquiry didn't come from this government. It came from the public defender's interim report where one of the main things that he came up with as being necessary, arising out of the events of which I've already spoken, was to have a proper thorough judicial inquiry into it. And we felt, given what took place, it was appropriate to do so. We're not seeking any political mileage out of it. As you can see from what has happened over the past week, it has become a source of comment in the public media about the cost. So we, there, there are no political gains that we're seeking to derive from this. It was the right thing to do, and we're setting it up in a way that we hope will be above the fray, that people will respect, respect the process and will feel that it is being professionally conducted in a fair and equitable manner and that the truth will come out. Okay, before I get to my substantive question, further to something you said earlier, Minister Golding, um, Audley Shaw told me yesterday, well, he made an observation saying, the cost for fees for the persons conducting the inquiry attorneys, etc., have been doubled in the West Kingston Commission of Inquiry compared to what obtained in the FinSAC inquiry. Am I understanding you to say that is not so? Yes, you're understanding me to say that that is not so. Um, the, if you compare the hourly rates of the different persons involved, some are a bit more, some are a bit less. If you aggregate them, as I've said already, in the case of his FinSAC inquiry, the hourly charges aggregated to $1,650 per hour. And in the aggregate charges for this inquiry is $1,670 per hour. That doesn't sound like doubling for me. I mean, he's not known for his mathematics, but it's not double. <laughs> All right. 
Well, there are two pieces of criticism mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. have been put into the public domain regarding the over $300 million budgeted for this inquiry, which mm -hmm. I invite you to respond to. For ease of reference, I outline two. One is that the administration of which you are a part is hard-pressed to find the money funds to attend to critical sectors, the hospitals, etc., that are suffering from chronic underfunding, but you found the money at a whim for this inquiry. That's one. And the second criticism I hear is that we need $10 million for the FinSec inquiry. And surely in the 1990s, persons might not have been shot dead on the spot, that sort of thing, but many persons suffered. Some even say perhaps it would have been better if they were shot. So the pain is, is, is rife from that. So the criticism is that you have not been able to find, or you are not willing, the administration of which you are part has not been willing to find the money for that exercise to bring some sort of closure. But you have found 350 million or 340 for this exercise, and therefore it really is convenient expenditure in furtherance of a political agenda. I invite you to respond to those two substantive criticisms. Well, in a sense, I've already responded to them, but I will reiterate um, and restructure my comments to specifically address those two points. First of all, in determining how money is spent, there are a million different things that need to be done in the country. There's not enough money to do any of them, largely. Uh, many services are underfunded. That is true. However, from time to time, things come up which have such significance or historic context and have such a major impact on the very fabric of your society the constitutional, political, social arrangements that underpin your society, that you have to be prepared to try and learn what this is. Have this commission of inquiry. It was not in our manifesto. It wasn't something that the government of the day set out to do. It arose from a report, the interim report of the public defender, which he took a few years to prepare. And his mandate, it was the previous government that mandated that he do that investigation, not us. He did that investigation. That was his recommendation. And it was a very difficult recommendation to resist if you read that report. There, this is a matter that needs to be thoroughly looked into. Had we not done though, supposing we had said, no, we're not going to investigate it, the 70 odd people died, but so it go. We would be, I think, justifiably criticized for that. As I've said already, the procedure that we've gone through, we came up with the terms of reference, we published them, we sought comments on them, we took comments into account before we finalized them. The opposition was invited to comment on it. The opposition was invited to comment on the appointment of the commissioners. This is not stuff that they did when they had the Manat inquiry. We were never given a chance to see the terms of reference. They, they appointed those commissioners on their own. We did not do that. We gave them and others the opportunity to comment on the terms of reference. Right through to Amnesty International provided comments. In terms of the commissioners, we, made, we, we, we suggested names. You'll recall that one person that was chosen that was not to their liking was not to the liking of the MP for the area. We, we disagreed with his analysis of that issue, but the fact is that we didn't want this Commission of Inquiry to embark on any kind of cloud, albeit a cloud in his own mind. So we said, no, we, we, that person recused herself, and we found somebody else who they found acceptable, and we've proceeded. In terms of the costs, we negotiated the costs with those persons. The chairman of the commission is accustomed to charging more, substantially more per hour than he's charging here. We got him down to a figure which is in line with what the chairman of the FinSAC and the chairman of the Manat inquiry charged. 
And similarly, the other hourly rates. Some, as I said, are a bit more, some are a bit less. But overall, the aggregates are similar. This is not a question of political convenience. This is something which it is we were asked to do by the public defender. In, in its 2013 report, it has taken us nearly two years to get to the point where the commission is on the way because the process has been designed to try and be inclusive and transparent. And now the JLP is saying we must stop it because the, the, the money is too much. To my mind, that is a position of raw political convenience because they do not want to come to that inquiry and have the truth told. Well, I'm sorry, the truth will be told. The inquiry will proceed. In terms of the second point, the, the FINSAC one, that's really an issue of principle, Mr. Fitzhenley. And it's not my call, all right? I've never been, uh, the, the, the issue as to whether that additional amount should be found or not is not my decision. But my understanding of that is the commissioners were paid the agreed amounts for their services. And they have not completed the work they were paid to do. And they want more, they want more money to be found to enable them to complete that although the budget was fully expended and the minister felt that that was in inappropriate and that they should finish the job with what they'd been paid and that has been the source of the dispute and you can take that up with him yeah. thanks um, mm -hmm. uh, we have a, a final question from Damien and then we'll um, wrap Damien? oh you you want to yield you, you <laughs> you have some yeah. more? Yeah, in line with your argument, a compelling argument that the historical nature or the nature of what transpired in West Kingston requires, demands that this society find money to bring some closure. What I'm wrestling with is could that argument not be applied, saying, notwithstanding the outstanding issues that you have mentioned, would you, Mark Bowling, not feel that based on what happened in the 1990s, that too demands closure? I do think that that too demands closure, and a commission of inquiry has been undertaken into that. The persons have all given their evidence. Important evidence was given. You recall that they even had to change one of the commissioners because he had what, he had interest. a conflict of interest, man, and uh, the court proceedings had to be undertaken to get that corrected and so on. As I said, it's not my call, but I understand the point of principle that has been taken, which is that they should complete the report. I think some secretarial support was even offered. Some secretarial support was, additional secretarial support was offered to enable them to do so. Yeah, um, they have been paid for their services and they must deliver what they were contracted to deliver. As I said, it's not my call. I do think that they should complete their report. I think it's a very important issue. Many per persons were impacted by it. The public purse was, was, was impacted by it. Uh, one thing though, <laughs> which seems to be often misunderstood though, is that what took place at that time was a, and the costs that were incurred by the by the public, by the state, the 40% of GDP of debt that was assumed was as a result of a decision to protect the depositors, pensioners, and policyholders of this country who had invested in, in entities that were insolvent, were bust. And it is public resources that were used to shore up the balance sheet of those institutions so that those persons could get their savings. Had, they not, had that decision not been taken, who knows what would have transpired? That decision was taken by the government of the day, and they stuck by it. In the course of that, assets had to be recovered, and borrowers felt that there were some um, issues around high interest rates and all, and those issues are what the inquiry has really been looking into, um, quite correctly, because persons felt very strongly about what took place. But I think it needs to be understood that the context of that was about saving the financial system of the country and saving the person, man and woman on the street 
who had their life savings locked away in institutions which, for one reason or another, often poor management or worse, resu uh, had, had resulted in, in, in going bust. Because I say poor management or worse because not all institutions failed. Some thrived. All right. Minister, thank you so much. We've had a full... Um, Damien, oh, Damien, I thought you had yielded. <laughs> Afterwards, you can talk. All right, we can, we can, we can entertain minister. Yes, in in fairness, in fairness, we were going to put the lid on things, but in fairness, we will take Damien and then we will close. We we will close. We will close. All right, thank you, minister. Just 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 allow Damien to ask his question. Just tell us, minister, as we consider the costs and we're trying to count the costs in in going forward. You're not too sure if it will cost less, less or more. Talk to us now about what the ministry, who perhaps may have overall responsibility for all that's taking place now, what you will be doing in terms of keeping things tight and ensuring that the funds are kept to a, a minimum, <laughs> even at this stage. Well, as I've endeavored to explain, it's not a question of costing less or more. What we have, if we've structured the the law has been structured and has been implemented in this case so that the maximum that can be charged by the persons providing these services is capped and it is that cap which has resulted in the budget that I've mentioned which ends up at 244 million for the principal persons who are engaged in the inquiry and there's another amount which the JDF and the JCF will have to absorb um, through the, and the money will have to be provided to, the, to, the, to that ministry for that purpose. As I've said as well, the actual costs may be within that, depending on how much time is spent on the inquiry and how long it takes. If it goes beyond that cap, that is at the risk of those persons who are providing the services. That's what a cap is for. In terms of how we manage it to minimize the costs, well, there's a secretary is engaged and they have to make claims and, and the suppo um, support the claims that they make for the hours that they work and so on. Um, it's, uh, it's managed in that sense. I don't know if the permanent secretary wants to add anything to that, but um, as I've said already, the hourly rates are, in my mind, while in, in a certain sense high, they are in line with the market rates charged by persons of the caliber of the persons who have been engaged to do the work. You know, if you want a thoroughbred racehorse, <laughs> it costs a certain cost. If you want a donkey or a mule, it's a different cost. So, you know, we wanted persons in this inquiry who could run the race in a transparent and professional way. And their fees are in line with what persons of that caliber charge and, and, and in keeping and in keeping with that yeah. minister i think we have had a full run this morning yeah. all right so <laughs> with that i yeah. want to um, minister mm -hmm. information um, closing comments from you um, well, I just thank want your to colleagues thank the, my colleagues in the media mm -hmm. and thank our guests who visited with us this morning and when we are off air and when our guests have left I would like to have a word, some housekeeping with our colleagues from the media. So if you'll give me two minutes afterwards, okay. won't take too long. So thank you, everybody. And I hope this year for you is productive and healthy and happy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good.